Fabio Poetica. This is our second reading this fall. We've got at least one more visiting poet coming up, and then also the MFA reading in December. Today we have Sarah Ann Wynn. Some of you have taken a look at her book already. She has copies for sale if you're interested in purchasing a copy. It's called Alma Almanac. And if you look through it, you can see that sometimes these are not what you might expect poems to be or to look like. And that's one of the reasons why I'm excited that Sarah is here and also that she's giving a talk. I think the poetry talks are really what distinguish our series from a lot of other poetry reading series, that we do the talk and the reading. And so we can get into the mind of the poet a little bit more. But you'll see that there are how-to poems and um, these sort of appendix poems with figures, figure references. So you have to imagine these images that are here but are not here, that are described in text but are not there visually. Uh, so she's a really interesting poet. And I think we met in person the first time at Woman Made Gallery yeah. in Chicago. But Sarah is from Virginia now and flew all the way across the country to be with us. So I want you to. Um, welcome, Sarah, but before you do that with a round of applause, take out your cell phone and make sure that you have silenced your cell phone. And while you're doing that, I want to thank the English department, um, particularly Joanna Levin, our department chair, who's up here in the front row, and David Krausen, our um, do-everything we need to have done person in the department, <laughs> uh, who, who is behind all the logistics uh, for Federal Poetica. So everybody have their cell phone silence? OK. Um, when you're done with this, be sure that you go on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And you're welcome to take a picture for Instagram <laughs> and say that you had a fantastic time at Tabula Poetica and that there's a reading at 7 PM tonight. All right. Let's welcome Sarah Ann Wynn. Hello, it's so good to be here. And I'm saying that fresh off of the beaches. So when I say it's good to be here, it is so good to be here. Um, I really want to thank Dr. Leahy for inviting me and also everyone in the English department, um, Dr. S. Dale and Dr. Levin. I really appreciate it and all of David Kaufman's help. It's just been such a, a dream to be out here. And I was so thrilled to be here and talk about what is my, um, my life's work, I feel, is talking about alas, grief, but also how to write through difficult things. Um, and I wanted to, when Dr. Leahy said that I could talk about my process or give ideas about my own aesthetic or um, things that drive my poem from inside, I knew immediately what I would want to talk about. It is such a part of me that I have made it a part of me. Accuracy, mystery, spontaneity. Those words just when I first heard them um, in an Elizabeth Bishop course when I was starting my grad graduate student work um, resonated so deeply with me, I felt like they were already a part of me. But I didn't understand how to make them a part of my work. Um, and Bishop almost immediately, well, first of all, those words come from an unpublished, I'm sorry, a published posthumously lecture that she never got to give. She was writing this lecture and said that these were her bywords, but she died before it could be completed. Um, so uh, those words didn't get out in the world until after her death. So my first grad student experience in the class just before the Elizabeth Bishop class Ask me, Dr. Pankey, who do you love and who would you like to punch? And I knew, like without a moment's doubt, who I loved. I love Jane Hirschfeld. I love um, poets that really connect with nature. Mary Oliver, I like accessible poets. I knew that before I even started grad school. Who I like to punch? I do not like Charles Bukowski. I knew that from the bottom of my heart. Um, and I wasn't afraid to say it. I like him better now, but not love. But I couldn't really articulate, aside from the nature-y parts, why I like them at all. And I certainly couldn't really make them influence my work in a meaningful way that I knew at the time. Um, but Eric asked the question. And he said, oh, you would probably like Elizabeth Bishop. And I see you're in that class. He became my mentor, so he knew me very well. And sure enough, the first class I took about Elizabeth Bishop, called Elizabeth Bishop, she was the person we studied. Um, 
we, she started, uh, Dr. Atkinson started talking about grandparent land. Jennifer Atkinson is a fine bishop scholar and a wonderful poet. And she started talking about Elizabeth Bishop's background. I was from grandparent land. I was raised by my grandparents. Elizabeth Bishop, her mother, commi or, I'm sorry, was committed to an institution when she was very young. Her father died when she was eight months old. She was shuffled from relative to relative to relative. And she said, I felt like a guest in my own life. Oh, well, as someone from grandparent land knows, you do often feel like a guest in your own life, even though your relatives are the ones that are keeping you afloat through life. We read poems like her Sestina, time to plant tears, said the almanac. The grandmother sings to the marvelous stove, and the child draws another inscrutable house. All of these words were so simple, but written directly from grandparent land, driven by a real big structure, the almanac. She mentioned words that I thought were forbidden in workshop. Grandmother, I thought I was not allowed to write poems about my grandmother. That was like tr direct train to sentimental land. And I wanted to stay away from sentimentality. I knew it was, or I thought I knew, it was forbidden. So to read, um, child, grandmother, tears. What? How is she allowed to do this? I just didn't understand at the time how she was able to make it work. So um, I started to realize that my grandparent land experience really did mirror hers in deeper ways also. My grandparent land experience was on a lake. This is actual um, Akron, Ohio, Coventry, the Portage Lakes. It's a series of man-made lakes. My grandparents' house was right there. So we literally were on the lake. So that enters into my poems <laughs> constantly because that was a constant in my childhood, just like the landscape of Elizabeth Bishop's childhood. So um, that's the, the physical place of my grandparent land. But you might notice these provide ecosystems for visible wildlife. When you live in a place with less visible wildlife, you have to seek it out. You, it doesn't become part of your daily language unless you actually are either looking for it or directly instructed about it. Well, if a blue heron is flying across the lake every single day, you start to wonder what the name of it is. So naming became very important to me. And I started to realize that maybe what I was afraid of wasn't sentimentality. Maybe what I was afraid of was cliches. Maybe that was what I was really afraid of. And I thought, well, do cliches equal sentimentality? I don't know. I wanted to write about real things plainly and intelligently, um, like the poets that I mentioned before. Um, so I realized that it wasn't a direct connection, that cliches don't equal sentimentality. As a matter of fact, Kay Ryan said that the poet's job is to reinvent cliches or to sort of subvert cliches or to renew them, to change them enough so that they re-enter the language. Um, so when I read these words, I thought, OK, I'm going to start looking at all of my writing through these lenses. Before I bring it to workshop, I'm going to see if the poems that I've got pass this test. Do they have some measure of accuracy? And that can be in sound, or it can be in factual, or factual nature, or it can be in um, a precision of the moment, which we'll talk about in a second. Do they pass the test of spontaneity? We'll get to that in a moment. And where's the mystery? How can I infuse my poems with mystery? That was in some ways the hardest to figure out. But we'll do accuracy first. Like I said, growing up on the, na on the lake, naming was um, a daily thing for my grandparents. Every night at the dinner table, my grandparents would quiz us on Bible facts or um, what had we memorized or trivia or you name it. Memorization was a very important thing. My grandpa was an electrical engineer. Facts were prime to him. They were at the top of his importance list. Um, so I knew that accuracy was important. I just didn't know how to get in my poems. So I thought, well, I'll start with apples. Apples are in all of my memories growing up. So I thought, well, there's a Baldwin apple tree on the corner of our lot. Um, as we left the driveway every day, you passed it on the way to the bus. You'd pass it coming home. In every season, it changed. It was a real um, constant in my life. So I started researching apples. This is the biggest rabbit hole 
that I encountered, I think, in my grad student career. I didn't know there were 7,500 varieties of eating apples in the US. 7,500 varieties, um, but only 100 are grown commercially. And out of those 100, only five are sold in grocery stores. So I was like, well, here's a place of disconnect. I grew up with heirloom apples. Um, without even knowing it, this is what I ate. We never bought apples from the grocery store. We ate off of our own trees. So um, there was that moment. And then I started thinking, okay, well, that, that names my memories. How else can I bring apples into my writing? If my sister was an apple, what would she be? If um, death was an apple, what would it be? How, how could I fortune tell using apples um, the way that, that lots of folklore uses? So I really <laughs> fell down this rabbit hole in a very deep way. Um, so, but I wasn't alone. Amy Nozuka Matadal has written about baking more than once. Um, even at the end of her poem, she takes a turn away from where I take it. I take it to memory in a very comforting place in Baldwin Apples, which I'll read in just a second. She takes it to a disquieting place. <laughs> so be it. Maybe all this baking will quiet the angry voices next door, if only for a brief whiff. I want our summers to always be like this, a kitchen wrecked with love, a table overflowing with baked goods, warming the already warm air. After all the pots are stacked, the goodies cooled, and all the counters wiped clean, let us never be rescued from this mess. That cacophony of sounds, she's using sound in a very precise way, in a very accurate way. Her memory is, an, is, accu is as accurate as mine is. Her experience is parallel, but she's using those sounds to kind of shake us up a little bit, to say, I really hoped, hope that this baking smooths out those sounds. Now, my Baldwin Apples does the opposite. I'm going to read it. So it's early on in the book. Baked are Baldwin apples. In October, their vinegar drew bees, or decay's sweetening drew bees. We brought bushel baskets and sorted, some for the compost, the gently bruised for pies. The best, those half gone with pocked, perfect skin, still a little green, for canning and apple butter. The Baldwins lured me to the kitchen counter, the turn and scraping colander mill when the cooked apples were poured in, the splash juice hot and delicious, space made by adding cooked apples apples carefully. She tipped the ancient Dutch oven and my idea of plenty poured down. Did you and she? I asked. Hush, she answered. I didn't dare move or some would go to waste. Save some for later, she said. Now we restock the canned goods cupboard. No beauty goes to waste here. Fill the shelf, Put up for lean winter the sweet of slow gathering afternoon, that long fragrant bake, the whole house cooked up and browned with cinnamon. In winter, the sound of that seal breaking snaps me back to sorting apples in the sun, their scent rolled from Atlanta's fingers, the breath of Eve before she bit. So that was a memory ripped from my childhood. There is nothing not factual in that poem, Those that down to the question. I started to ask her something about my mother. My grandmother cut me off. This is reportage as poetry. And definitely I could have written it as a paragraph, flat out. These are the facts. Um, and part of my librarian background, I was a school librarian for 15 years, wanted me to be accurate in a way that I was only telling the factual truth. At that point, this was er written early in my grad school career, I didn't really understand what I owed the truth of the poem. So that maybe there was a larger truth there about grieving that I wasn't ready to say yet because I was so demanding of myself with the facts as I was reporting them almost. So I really stuck to accuracy in this one in the truth of the moment and as close as I could to the sounds um, and the senses, trying to be real and present. Um, Along with those rehabilitated cliches, I really didn't want to um, have like a sepia-toned um, imagined conversation where there was resolution about my grandmother saying something that she didn't say. I didn't want something pretend. I wanted the real thing that happened. Um, and I think that probably is not as bishopy in that poem as I thought it was, because she was often very mysterious and kind of um, 
not willing to speak about the things she was addressing. Um, so the, what role do facts play in poetry? Richard Hugo in Triggering Town says, you owe reality nothing and the truth about your feelings everything. So if I had read back over that poem and tried to rewrite it now, I might change some things. My grandfather has died. My, grandparent, my childhood home has been completely changed. It's a different time. So I probably could write a you know, Baldwin Apples grafted somewhere else <laughs> poem and write a different sort of truth that may say something different. And I think that poetry allows for that. Um, I, another K. Ryan quote. K. Ryan was on my. Um, on my list of people I might talk about, and obviously she's creeping in just as much as Elizabeth Bishop. I love her work. She says, I like the sound of facts, but I don't care about them as facts. I like them as texture. So um, as I got closer to the end of my um, graduation, I thought, how can I use facts as texture? I read this quote and I thought, OK, well, I I could actually use details and collage them with other details and leave it to the reader to figure out what I'm trying to say. So that's where those appendix poems came from, those figures that were very brief. They're just little snippets of um, images. When my publisher called me to say that my book had won the prize, it was just like the movies. They call you and he says, waking me from a nap, are you, are you sitting down? And I'm like, I'm laying down, but I can stand up and sit back down if you need me to. Um, I, I didn't know what he wanted, honestly. I had no idea what this call was about. And um, he said, well, uh, Elaine Equi has selected your book. And I just, I couldn't, I thought I was still asleep. I mean, I wasn't fully present until five minutes into the conversation when something he said registered. And he's like, oh, it'll be very costly, though, um, to get permission for all these images that you describe in the figures. And I'm like, what images am I describing in the figures? What are you talking about? And he says, well, you've got figure 398, or here's one. Um, figure 1780, moth pinned to cork board, wings pattern of dictionary's pages, some words bolded. They say her finely inked wings are composed of scales. They say she will not fly again once you touch her. The words are permanently changed. Figure 1811, a marred fallen leaf, the spectrum of apple colors, the page where small jaws nod a name. And I said, those aren't images. Those are out of my head. This is poetry. Like, I, did, I made it all up. All, all of this, this thing right here, I made this up that you just accepted. And he said, oh, well, that will certainly be cheaper. But then, <laughs> yes, that was the good news. But then um, he gave me an editor who fact-checked me. And that was, we had many startling conversations because she would read these and say, there's no evidence of a real grandparent island any, in any atlas. And I said, well, no, this is an emotional atlas. <laughs> I feel that there is a grandparent island in my imagination somewhere. And I put it in this book. I situated it there. And so we had to keep having these conversations about facts versus um, poetry. And that was very interesting to me. So um, she was more interested the further we got into it. But at first, she was very resistant to the idea that we were publishing not facts in the book that couldn't be annotated. Um, but you know, these are the conversations you have. I think this was part of spontaneity for me. I love this, this meme. Help me, I'm trapped in a haiku factory. Save me before they. <laughs> this is like the definition of spontaneity for me, where you've got the expected form, and then it's subverted because even though you're obeying the form, you're left with no reasoning or no end answer to this. This is a way that spontaneity can enter into your poetry. The unexpected, those surprises, can really add um, interest and texture to your work, maybe beyond what your editor or your um, publisher is fully comfortable um, with. So spontaneity. I'm a huge fan of Terry Pratchett. And I think that he said he has a really, really good point here. Sometimes you laugh because you've got no more room for crying. Sometimes you laugh because table manners on a beach are funny. And sometimes you laugh because you're alive when you really shouldn't be. So you've got the like tragic, um, ironic, no more room for crying kind of spontaneity where it cracks open into what must be because nothing else can happen. You, you must go on, but you can't bear to go on, but you must go on. And that spontaneity is unexpected. 
Um, of course, funny haha -ha can enter poetry. And that rejoicing in aliveness. Sometimes you laugh because you're alive when you really shouldn't be. I think is at the heart of so much poetry. Um, Jane Kenyon's The Blue Bowl, which is in your packets, has that moment. Here, let's see. And we can read the whole thing. It's pretty short. Jane Kenyon, the late wife of Donald Hall. She died tragically young. Um, the Blue Bowl by Jane Kenyon. Like primitives, we buried the cat with his bowl. Barehanded, we scraped sand and gravel back into the hole. It fell with a hiss and thud on his side, on his long red fur, the white feathers that grew between his toes, and his long, not to say aquiline, nose. We stood and brushed each other off. There are sorrows much keener than these. Silent the rest of the day, we worked, ate, stared, and slept. It stormed all night, now it clears, and a robin burbles from a dripping bush, like the neighbor who means well, but always says the wrong thing. Well, I mean, if that's not like Alanis Morissette ironic, I don't even know what is, where you leave the funeral and the sun comes out from behind the clouds as if everything's okay when you feel that nothing will be okay again. And I think that, um, that's something that I had to learn to put in my poems, that it was OK to grieve in my poems and just leave it on the page that there are going to be things that are sad. You know, you can't laugh through them, but you can be awful but cheerful and let the reader grieve with you. And I think that awful but cheerful quote, by the way, is Elizabeth Bishop, um, The Bite. It's from a poem that she wrote on her birthday um, as she was aging. And I think you really feel that relentlessness of things that you can't get through, but you have to keep going um, in that poem. So another, I, I don't know why I skipped this slide when I was doing the presentation, but another way to insert humor in poems is just to talk back to the authors. And it really is one of my favorite things to do. I've written so many poems <laughs> that are either in response to a famous poem or something in their life or talking directly to them or a line that I didn't like and I resisted. Um, so I wrote a response piece to Gerard Manley Hopkins' Pied Beauty and he has this spontaneity that is joy and he just goes on and on with this onslaught of beautiful sounds. And you'll hear the spontaneity just dance through it. Pied Beauty, glory be to God for death Dappled things, for skies of couple color as the brindled cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trouts that swim, fresh fire coal, chestnut falls, finches' wings, landscapes plotted and pierced, fold, fallow, and plow, and all trades their gear and tackle and trim, all things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change, praise him. That is like a nonstop, just one after another, um, sound pummeling. I love it. But I think that's how he expressed his joy, was all these sounds entering into his poems. So for me to respond to him, of course, I had to bring apples in. So I have pied beauties with me. Um, I was, I'm in an, a Hopkins anthology with a bunch of responses to Hopkins, Gerard Manley Hopkins poems. And I'm so pleased to be in it because he, I love his work. Pied beauties. Glory be to God for appled things, for stretches of counters dusty with flour as dirt roads, a plate palette gashed with green and red doled, cut, peeled, and portioned in plenty, for strudel rings, for spice cakes and sauces, for amber juice, for pie a la mode, for cider spiced and mulled or served cold, all dumplings starified, crimped, arranged, whatever is oven ready, brushed with egg yolks, overloaded, full of orchards, caramelized, ripened to gold, sugar crusted, milk beads writing pillion, memorialize, bake them. How could he resist writing about pies when he had the word pies in his thing? Anyway, I love apples. So I thought I had to say that it's not all sadness when you're talking about spontaneity. And often it is joy. You can definitely use it either way. So now we come to mystery. And I really do think that um, at first, 
mystery was mysterious to me. I did not understand that, as uh, many people have said most recently, I think Sherman Alexie, the fallen hero of, of literature land right now, um, said that all books are mysteries. I think all poems can be mysteries because you have to kind of delve into them. You don't want to make your reader the sort of bumbling detective, but you do want to leave something for them to discover. I think that's really important. Um, so this, can, this mystery can be an internal logic or the illogical treated as logical, like the how-to poems that I have in my book that are not rational how-tos. Um, they can address the unknown or unknowable. Um, and this is a place where the spiritual or metaphysical can enter in. There are many things that can happen in this moment of wonder um, and mystery in the poems. But I thought I would bring really my favorite fully mysterious poem by Lorca that's in your packets. You have the Spanish version. I am only just now, thanks to Duolingo, learning Spanish, so I will not torment you with my reading of the Spanish version. I will read the English version. Um, this is by Federico Garcia Lorca. The moon rises. When the moon comes up, the bells are lost, and there appear impenetrable paths. When the moon comes up, the ocean blankets the earth, and the heart feels like an island in infinity. No one eats oranges under a full moon. One must eat cold green fruit. When the moon comes up with 100 equal faces, silver money sobs in the pocket. Oh. I read that and I get the chills every time. I've read it many times. Those echoes of images, all the circles, the faces, the silver money, the oranges, and then the mysterious logic of having to eat cold green fruit under the full moon. There's no factual logic in this poem, but it has a strange sort of inter um, internal logic that feels true when you read it. Yes, this is the rule. When I'm under a moon, I have to eat cold green fruit. No oranges, please. Um, and I think that, that that mystery is OK to have in a poem where it wouldn't necessarily be in a nonfiction book um, without your editor being very upset with you. Um, so before I got here, I did not know that the filling station was an actual place in, um, in California. And I was eating breakfast, and I thought, wait a second. I'm eating at the filling station. I'm going to talk about the filling station. I had a very meta moment. Um, but I was so excited. I took a picture and posted on Instagram and everywhere. This is one of my all-time favorite Bishop poems because I think it has everything. It has all the things that um, she, has, she has said she aspires to, and certainly that I aspire to, accuracy, spontaneity, and mystery. So let's take a quick look at it. The filling station. By Elizabeth Bishop. Oh, but it is dirty. This little filling station, oil soaked, oil permeated to a disturbing overall black translucency. Be careful with that match. Father wears a dirty oil soaked monkey suit that cuts him under the arms and several quick and saucy and greasy sons assist him. It's a family filling station, although quite thoroughly dirty. Do they live in the station? It has a cement porch behind the pumps, and on it, a set of crushed and grease-impregnated wicker work. On the wicker sofa, a dirty dog, quite com comfy. Some comic books provide the only note of color, of certain color. They lie upon a big dim doily, draping a tabaret, part of the set, beside a big hirsute begonia. Why the extraneous plant? Why the tabaret? Why, oh why, the doily? Embroidered in daisy stitch with marguerites, I think, and heavy with gray crochet. Somebody embroidered the doily. Somebody watered the plant or oil, oils it, maybe. Somebody arranges the rows of cans so that they softly say, as so, 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 to high-strung automobiles. Somebody loves us all. Well, accuracy. She has a real precision of, of details there. She's not looking away from its dirtiness. She's not cleaning it up for a Hallmark filling station that is on Instagram. <laughs> she is picturing this doily station where it is, as it is. It's dirty. It's filthy. She brings it up several times. But then, in precision, she also, in accuracy, she also has a pattern. And I did not even notice it until 
I don't know, it had to have been like the 50th reading of this poem. Many, many readings after I first wrote about it for grad school. Um, she repeats words in a pattern. How could I have missed that? I have no idea. But she does. She repeats words that are so simple and buried, oil soaked, oil permeated in the first stanza. Um, in the second stanza, well, I, greasy, greasy, dirty, dirty, sorry. In the third stanza, wicker, wicker. In the fourth stanza, doily, doily, or I'm sorry, color, color. In the fifth stanza, why, 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 why? <laughs> she repeats it many times. Um, but also, marguerites are daisies. She probably had daisies in there somewhere of the first go round and scratch it out. So daisy is kind of an understood pattern. And then in the final one, somebody, 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 and so, so, so. The first thing you're told as a young child writing poetry is find better words. If you're repeating yourself, find a different synonym and put it in because repetition is boring. If it's boring, how is it that we didn't even notice it in this poem? It was intentional. She put it in there in a strategic way so that we wouldn't notice it, but it would become permeated as part of the, the situation of the, the filling station. Spontaneity, she's got humor throughout. Why, oh why, those kind of sarcastic questions. Or the monkey suit. The father is kind of a comical figure. It's too small for him. It cuts him under the arms. Um, the comic book appears. Those moments of levity in the poem. And then mystery, somebody. Somebody did these things. Who was it? I don't know. And then she says the forbidden. Somebody, vague, loves us all. <laughs> she makes this big statement at the end that felt forbidden to me the first time I read it. And I think it's just so beautiful, um, the way that she does it. And it, it hits you. It's a, I think it's a beautiful, effective poem. Um, before I get to the Terry Pratchett quote, which I think is, like I said, Terry Pratchett is, he is my favorite. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> sorry guys and girls and people, all the people. Um, I just wanted to say that a lot of my poems were written in an effort to do what she did with Filling Station. I kept trying to revisit it with different echoing words or um, with different ideas. And the only poem that I think got somewhere close to it was my poem Floats, which I've read many different places. And I don't want to take up too much more of your time to do that part. I might read it tonight. Um, but just to say that responding to a poet you love starts getting to the heart of why you write. So just without even being told what your favorite poem or poet's uh, bywords are, many poets have said them outright, but many haven't, you can just start by having a conversation with someone you love, whether they've died or not. Start writing towards them or in a style that they use or just responding to something they've said to get at the heart of why you write what you write. It'll really help you. Um, I'm, not, I'm gonna save the Terry Pratchett quote to the end, but I wanted to ask what questions you had, if any. You may not have questions. Oh, maybe I'll read the Terry Pratchett quote while you think about questions. All right, well then I will. I'll do it. All right, Terry Pratchett has, has much wisdom buried in his very funny books. He really does. And this one is in A Hat Full of Sky. And I was like, well, if I'm giving advice to anyone, I just want to include this very good advice for everyone, not just writers. Always face what you fear. Have just enough money, never too much. Not a poet problem, I will tell you. And some string. Even if it's not your fault, it's your responsibility, which is deal with things. Writers deal with things. Do what you must do. Never lie, but you don't always have to be honest. Especially don't wish upon a star, which is astronomically stupid. Open your eyes, and then open your eyes again. You think you've seen something? Look again, look closer. Keep looking at it. Revisit the things that you love again and again so that you really get at their hearts. All right, now what questions do you have now that you've had a second? really stuck, my way to like combat fear of not being original was to stay as true to my own self and history and perspective as possible, but I learned, I've had to learn how to relinquish some truth for the sake of a stronger joke, for the sake of a stronger story. Do you think that like, when it comes down to it, 
would you stick to the truthful thing or? So given truth or mystery? Yeah. <laughs> so I always have the, the um, voice of my grandparents rankling in my head. So like there's always that question. That's a question I face with almost every time I sit down at the, at the computer. I think I start with the truth. And then um, the more I reread it, what, whatever seems to be emerging that the poem wants, I go in that direction. So that if it means veering off and saying, OK, am I really trying to say something else here? Because sometimes you don't know what you're going to say. When you sit down at the computer, you're not ready to say that thing, that important thing. It's buried somewhere underneath there. And often the route to the thing that you need to say via the thing that you started out to say is through what the poem wants, just writing towards that. So I think the truth of the poem has to be prime. Um, you, do, do you think that like writing exclusively fiction things that are not true, is that something that's kind of helpful in this process? Um, I don't know. I have to say, I had dinner last night with a friend from 25 years ago who got my book very recently. And, he, and I, we were having the same conversation. And he said, everything in there seems true to what you told me when I knew you. And I'm like, well, maybe in the end, it does boil down to that. Like it comes back around through paths that you don't know. You don't even know yourself yet what the truth is for you when you first set out to write. And not knowing and writing into mystery is often the better way to go, because then you're allowing for those truths to be encountered, rather than saying, no, 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 that's not truth. I have to herd that back into the truth. You're boxing yourself into, into a place where you're not allowing that mystery to enter in. And sometimes the best thing to do is just end with a question, or let, let the open-ended questions stay open in what you're writing. You're not, I mean, I don't know all the truth. I'm still finding out things, so I'm, I assume I will till I die. So I just let it happen. Can you think of an instance where you know you lied in one of the poems in the book? Oh, so many. <laughs> um, yes, matter of fact, um, I was going to read one tonight that was in that sort of, um, I, it's possible it's true. I don't know. There, my, because my grandparents adopted me, my mother died very, very young. Um, so I don't know a lot of the stories. And they didn't know a lot of the stories. This is my, my dad's parents. So they didn't know anything about my mother's family, really. They knew about my, um, my grandmother's stories, my mom's mom. But if she died when she was 23, do you tell your parents all of your stories? I don't think so. So my guess is that, um, no, I, I think there's a lot that, that is untrue, whether it's because I had to guess or because I outright said, OK, I've got to fill something in here. I'm looking for it flipping through because it's one of the ones that doesn't have a name. Um, it's got paper dolls. So I'm looking for the, um, oh, here we go. Actually, this is, a, this is a different one, but it does the same exact thing. My grandpa died, and we encountered all these things in his closet that were um, kept from his childhood that he never talked about. So his mother's x-ray, she died of tuberculosis, was about this big. It was gigantic, and it was shoved behind all the drawers. He didn't want to talk about it. Um, it was shoved behind all the drawers in the file cabinet. Well, I pulled it out, and I was like, what must this have cost him to keep like, what a painful, secret sadness that he had that I never knew. His mother died of this painful disease. And my mother died, and he never talked about our connection. So I had to write about our connection as if this had happened this way. The life-size x-ray is true. So figure one, a life-size x-ray of a woman's lungs, shadowy places and cavities, age brown, letters, TB, are scrawled on the label at the bottom of the x-ray. His mother was told to hold her breath. Um, figure two, a halved woman's heart. Signs of weakness caught too late are still invisible to doctors. Figure three, color four by four snapshot labeled Easter 19. Two girls pose hand in hand on the sidewalk in ruffles. The older squints at the photographer solemnly. His shadow stands on its head beside them. The younger laughs and waves her basket. Their mother has faded just as tulips opened. The girls will go to church with their grandparents. I don't have any dissection of my mother's heart. I made that up. Like I, I wondered how 
can I put the intersection of bodies, the things that went wrong with my mother and his mother, how can I put them in something that is as spare as I can get it and still be lying? Um, like not, not be filling in the gaps, not leave out things that were important. But that could have happened. It was true that she died before they knew really what was wrong. So it just happens that way. Sometimes you have to make up the bridge and you just use your best guess. Any other questions? Or, well, let, me, oh, let me come back to you because he's got one. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back. Yeah, um, so earlier you were talking about how there were some like, topics that you didn't really want to write about that you felt were like, broken in. Um, I think that like that can be like even like pushed bigger, like how society is kind of like that and how like some things people don't want to talk about. Like how, what like advice could you give someone to like kind of break that? That, I think that there are a lot of writers that, that you can tell there's that wall. Like they never push past it. Like they could let, write for an entire lifetime and they never push past that. And they never like truly intimate with like how they're feeling and like what they want to talk about. Like was it something specifically that happened to you or did you just like start writing like that one day or what did you, like how did you achieve that? I think I found out, and it was in grad school, Unfortunately, very late in my grad school career, I'd written a great deal of poems not about the things I needed to write about. Um, I learned tactics and tools and things like that. But then my grandpa died this, my thesis here. Um, while I'd written only about 30% of my thesis, which is a book length project, um, you're required to write a book length project. And so all of a sudden, I had this grief that was every time I came to the page, I didn't want to write about it. And certainly I thought, I'm going to write all the Hallmark cards that were ever written for my thesis. That's what's going to be the result of this. But I thought, I've got to do something. I can't, I can't end my um, grad school career like this. I'm going to have to write it. And, so, and certainly I didn't, I didn't think he'd want that. I didn't think it was a good way to honor what, what he was to me. And so I made myself. And I don't know that making yourself get to a place that you're not ready to get to when it comes to being open, forcing yourself open is not always a, a good path, but it was the only path I had. So I made myself sit down and write through grief. Um, certainly there are so many topics that I agree society says we're just not interested. It is boring to be a 40-year-old middle-aged woman. It is boring to be a mom. That's what society says. We don't want any more books about X. And that's um, just encountering a lot of people's interviews. Their path to publishing is very difficult if, if they are perceived as a cliche. And so um, they still had to write them because it's who they were. It's what they had to offer. And I think that just because the world isn't saying, you know, pounding down your door for something doesn't mean that you don't need to write it for yourself. And I think the best gift you can give yourself is to be honest with yourself anyway and know what it is you want and who you are. So write it down. And if the world doesn't want it, it doesn't want it. The world doesn't have the best taste sometimes. <laughs> Alas. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. That's a hard answer. Um, it's a hard question. But it's one you're probably going to struggle with for the rest of your life. I struggle with it every day. Does the world want any more poems about grief? Nobody's knocking on my door for them. <laughs> but they're what comes sometimes. You just have to write them. Did, well, let me, I'll come back to, like, I'll come back to the, second, the second round of questions after we go up the first round. All right, the person behind you had his hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, were you able to distinguish, distinguish truth in your poetry in a sentimental way without the fear of sounding too cliche? <laughs> I cannot tell a lie. The easiest, it got so much easier after I started writing the hybrid poems. The more I stripped away, the easier it got um, to figure out what was excessive. Like I liked writing the spare things, and I like, I still like writing spare things. I like writing towards um, letting the reader take the final jump. I like that now. I didn't like it at first. I like saying at the end of my poems, do you get it? Do you? Because I'm saying this. That's how I like to write first. Um, but now I like, I like coming from the opposite direction. So I think pair back. Um, that helped me. 
Anyone else before I come to the second round with, with my friend? Oh, yeah, sure. A little bit about your writing process. I was looking at an old interview, and it, it seemed to suggest that you are diligent about writing everything. Oh, yeah. And is, is that really true? <laughs> it is true. I do. I write every day. Um, sometimes it's only for five minutes. Um, but I'm a real believer in routines. The habits that you build form um, bridges in your mind, like pathways in your mind, and it becomes easier and easier once you know that that's what you're supposed to do. It's like you sit down and things start to happen. So even if it's just five minutes a day, it's better than nothing. So often my five minutes is, <laughs> if I'm in the car, I record on my phone, like take out my phone and record something if I'm super busy. Or if I only have five minutes, I do a prompt because then I'm directed to whatever it is that I'm supposed to be writing, supposed to be writing. Um, so it's like a mini assignment. But yeah, I do. I have a real rigid routine. As a matter of fact, like I do, I have five minutes of ukulele if, I, if I'm not traveling, five minutes of Duolingo, five minutes of writing, plus five minutes, whatever other time I have, at least one submission and at least one tracking thing, because poetry requires tracking of some sort. And so I try to work that in to my routine. At least one submission every day? Yeah. 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 <laughs> that is the, the um, unfortunate truth about publication is y you have to really work at the bureaucratic side of it. You've got to do the work of sending it out, because no one's beating down your door unless you're Mary Oliver. No one is calling me saying, Hello, we'd like some more of these poems, please. <laughs> no one's doing that, so I have to keep sending them out. And getting used to no was really hard. But it's way easier if you've heard it 30,000 times not to take it personally. <laughs> Unless you start to care too much, which, man, some hurt more than others, honestly. But yeah, I write every day. Yeah. <sighs> not easy, and certainly not, by the way, I don't write good things every day. I just write every day. <laughs> I should fill that in. Important to say. Routines are good. Yeah? You say you write every day. I'm, like, I'm a strong believer in routine as well, so I understand why you try to write every day, but what do you do if you just reach like, a total roadblock? I, do, I love prompts. I, this is, it's such a, um, it's not a, it's not a, um, problem that a lot of people have. I don't, I don't have writer's block. I took a great class called Creative Processes with an art department in my, um, master's program was working closely with the art department anyway. They had a call and response type exhibit, so I knew the teachers there. And I took an independent study about the creative process for visual artists. And um, the things we were reading said, the, the habits that you build are what are going to sustain you as a professional. And um, that whether you're a visual artist or a creative writer or architect, the habits you build are what keep you a professional. So regardless of whether I was getting published, the only thing I could call myself a professional doing was these constant things, doing the job of being a poet. So yeah, the art, that class changed my way of looking at writing. It was wonderful. So I still, I still use the, the tools I learned in that class often. And where do you get prompts? Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. I do. They're, they're available everywhere. Especially um, Poetic Asides, Robert Lee Brewer's. That's what I started off with. Um, Robert Lee Brewer, who works um, wrote with Writer's Digest, has a blog that every, every week, once a week for the last, I want to say it's like 15 years, he's posted a prompt. So if I really get stuck, I go back to those, but I've done many of those. Um, there also are a bunch of art journaling prompts that for whatever reason I like because they give you a format and they give you a, a piece. So like the procedural poems come from some of those where it's, if it says um, watercolor and birds, then I try to work them somehow into a poem. Like that's my next step so that I'm not necessarily taking just writing prompts. Um, so I try to get them from many places. But Instagram has a number of accounts that are um, prompts. Twitter has a number of accounts that are daily prompts. Um, I'm trying to think of where else. There are, just, there are so many. There are many places to get prompts. Find them online. That's very useful. What other questions do you have? Yeah. yeah. Honest, 
material and then discovered it afterwards to be really similar to something that's already been produced? Um, yes, partly because some of these are, it's the opposite direction where I'm inspired by someone else's thing. I mean, not real, especially not since I've started the hybrid stuff. Um, the apples, I guess that, actually the baked, the one that I included that was the baked goods poem, I discovered that recently and I felt like, whoa, someone else is writing about bacon. <laughs> Everyone has written about baking. I don't know why in my mind all of a sudden it freaked me out. But yeah, that, that one. I'm trying to think, I don't think any other that, that were so, felt so similar in impetus. That's just a personal fear of mine is finding too many, like being like, oh, this was, I didn't, I didn't even know that existed, but then I feel like it just feels too similar to something and then I won't even look at it. Um, well, I'm, I really am a believer in archetypes. I mean, I think Jung's archetypes say that we as human beings encounter stories that are similar to ours across cultures. Um, people that are like your doppelganger on the other coast that have similar experiences. There's no getting around it, but you are an individual and your voice, especially the more you do it, the more your voice is going to come from your personal experience. And no one can duplicate that. You can't live a ripped off life, like if you're being honest with yourself. So um, it, was, it was a shock that baked goods poem, but I didn't think to myself, I better pull that Baldwin Apples poem. The biggest fear I have about this sort of thing is I'm writing a bunch of centos right now, which means, so they're the poems that you take a single line from a long work and collage it with a bunch of sources um, to make a brand new work about something different. And my fear is I've got all these collected lines that I somehow am accidentally addressing the same subject that the original poem addressed, like coming full circle, that somehow the metaphor gets to me so well that I change my topic and I, I don't know, I fear that. So I keep double checking all my lines. <laughs> but um, I don't know, I just go off on my own obsessions and usually that, that they're so individual to yourself, your own obsessions, that you rarely are going to encounter someone that's that close to you. And even if it's the same experience, my, my best friend also lost her mother, also was raised by her grandparents, has never written anything like anything I've written. So, you know, I think just hold true to who you are. Don't discard your unique experience as an individual. You mentioned hybrid several times. Can you give us sort of your definition of, of what you're talking about and how that applies to what you're doing? Yes, so hybrid, hybrid texts take the format of a different type of text. A reference work is usually mine um, because I'm a librarian, an almanac, a lunar chart, which I'll read tonight, um, a field guide, and they, they infuse poetic devices, more lyric things into that format, filling it out as if it's a poem. So you're using sort of the skeleton of something else the existing form that, that appears, and then transforming it into something different. Um, that's my definition of hybridity. And I, I do, I love doing that. If I could, I mean, <laughs> I have a hard time not repeating myself. I'm way more worried that I'm gonna be repeating myself and not saying something new than I am about ripping off someone else because I'm so in love with these forms that I wanna play with them. But yeah, I, I love hybridity. And, oh, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. You know, I'm such a, like, I'm, I like to tidy things up. So um, there are things that I'm working on that have ended, but they're not finished. And even um, when they sent me the galleys for this, I was like, that poem is not like that anymore. Why is this like this? Um, so just keep hewing away at it. I, I don't think a poem has ever really finished its abandonment. It's like the, what was uh, Paul, Valer Paul Valery said that a poem is never finished, it's just abandoned. Whenever you're ready to abandon it, that's when it's done. If I really get stuck, I work on something else for a while. And I've got, I've usually got a bunch of pots on the stove. Like I've got, that's why I have a lot of chat books is I like to work on tons of projects. So I just go on to the next project and let, let the other one simmer. It'll come, just relax. 
Any other questions? Unless the semester's ending, you have to turn them in. You're oh, yes. Yes, unless the semester's ending. And then ask a question. <laughs> End your poem with an unknown. <laughs> I don't know how this ends. <laughs> All right, I think we'll wrap this up yeah. for now. Uh, we do have books if you are interested in purchasing a copy of Alma Almanac, and I hope that you will come back at 7 o'clock this evening. If you do have individual questions, we can stick around for another 15 minutes or so to chat individually. Thank you all. And thank you. Oh, thank you for being such a good audience.